Hello and welcome to Maiden Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Rana Mitter, Professor of uh, History and Politics of Modern China at the University of Oxford, author of many books on China, including uh, A Bitter Revolution and China's War with Japan. We spoke today about Chinese sexual politics, uh, the consequences of the one-child policy in terms of China's coming demographic collapse, uh, the use of dating apps in urban China, and why so many professional Chinese women will understate their own educational credentials in order to land a husband. As always, you can also find Maiden Mother Matriarch at my substack, louiseperry.substack.com, where you can find extended episodes, bonus episodes, and the MMM chat community. Enjoy. Uh, Rana, I want to start by asking you to explain what is the rice rabbit movement? Well, to understand in China what the rice rabbit movement uh, has been about, you have to translate it into Chinese, which is mi tu, uh, mi rice tu, rabbit. Uh, in other words, um, it is uh, a direct transliteration of the term me too which of course, uh, particularly from the late 2010s, was uh, an immensely well-publicized movement pushing, ga- pushing back against sexual harassment. And what isn't often as well known is that because of the uh, permeability of the internet, a lot of those uh, um, uh, aspects of that movement uh, became known in China as well. Um, I'd say as in the West, it was probably even bigger on the Chinese internet, perhaps three to four years ago, something like that, but st- still certainly the term is known. And it symbolizes, I think, two things. One is the fact that this particular issue of sexual harassment was very, very much part of the everyday conversation in offices, in workplaces, in domestic environments in China. And also that there is international influence, that sometimes the conversations that we have about these issues, while they seem often to reflect what happens in the Western world only, actually have a rather wider um, purchase. And that purchase comes in part because of the way in which social media has changed the way that we interact with each other. The one advantage here, I think, that at least some of the professional Chinese have is that they're very much able to read the English language social media and draw from it, whereas the number of people in the West who read the Chinese social media is just much smaller. Mm. So did it emerge at about the same time as Me Too in America and and in the Anglosphere, or was there a slight time lag? I think it's fair to say that the period in which the Me Too movement in China became uh, prominent was pretty similar to the period in the Western world, in other words, the mid to late 2010s. Um, The circumstances in which it emerged, though, were in some ways similar and some ways different. If we think about the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too in the West, as being the product of a whole variety of social changes, particularly in terms of the uh, effects of first and second wave feminism, in terms, more broadly speaking, of the way in which workplaces changed. And of course, an awful lot of what was talked about there was the way in which work environments were made hostile, uncomfortable, unfriendly, unacceptable for uh, professional women. Well, that, of course, has been an issue in China as well, particularly in the era from the 1980s, 1990s, when the cities expanded and boomed professional jobs in services, in retail, and a whole variety of areas, also became a reality for um, ordinary Chinese men and women. But the circumstances were also very, very different for one really important reason, which is that unlike in the Western world, or indeed in Japan, or even in India, China was is and will be, I think, for the foreseeable future, run by a single authoritarian party state, the Chinese Communist Party, which takes a very strong, very close view of how society develops. And I suspect that one of the things that we'll keep coming back to as we chat, um, Louise, is the way in which Chinese society is both quite similar to much of the rest of the world when it comes to dealing with issues of sexuality, of relationships, of the way in which the personal, private and public interact with each other, and how being in a country that is run by a single party state with a very, very strong desire to penetrate its influence throughout all aspects of society, including the private sphere, makes a real difference in terms of the way that women and men think about these issues. And the... uh... 
the external focus offered by social media, the fact that it is possible to very quickly import American social movements like Me Too into China, how does the CCP regard that? Well, when it comes to movements that come in from the outside world, the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is extremely suspicious, extremely sceptical, extremely hostile. Um, there's a term which you don't hear so much now. It comes back now and then, but it was very big, actually, as far back as the 1980s, which is uh, Jingshan Wuran, spiritual pollution, which was a way of talking about how unacceptable ideas would come in from the outside world. Now, back in the 80s and 90s, social media, of course, wasn't a factor either in the West or in China, but they were talking about books, television shows, um, you know, other forms of, of, of media. But I don't want to get too hung up on the American side of things, because I think one of the things that's really worth stressing is that China always has, and certainly at the moment continues to generate its own conversations about both um, the opportunities that changes in society bring about, but also the challenges, difficulties and problems that come from that as well. And while there is sometimes influence, I mean, the rice rabbit and me too is a good example of how you can have that sort of internationalization of the language. It's really worth noting that an awful lot of things that people talk about and think about are much more domestic conversations. Just to give one example, one area that I think is fascinating to look at in terms of looking at how uh, you know, today's Chinese public think about issues of relationship, sexuality, um, and how it fits into society uh, is not just social media, but more traditional media in the shape of television. Now, less than three years ago, 2020, the biggest hit series on Chinese television was a show called uh, Sanxia Ari, uh, translated as Nothing But 30. It's actually a quote from Confucius, of all people, the great Chinese philosopher of two and a half thousand years ago, who said, amongst other things, at the age of 30, I took my stand or I sort of became independent in, in, in my life. And it builds into the idea that at the age of 30, it's a turning point for men as, as well as women, but certainly for, for women in terms of often very traditional um, set of expectations in society about marriage and so forth. Now, this television series followed the paths of three fictional women who basically face different challenges in their lives at the age of 30. One is think she's fairly happily married and then it turns out sorry spoilers folks that you know her husband seems to be having an affair and this you know really throws the marriage into turmoil. Another one is someone whose marriage is sort of kind of okay but she's basically settled for someone who's you know not that, that great and the third one is doing you know very very successful in a very competitive cutthroat business uh, she's in retail um but she can't find a partner and this is you know causing her uh, distress she can't sleep at night when she gets ill there's no one there for her so these dilemmas were you know discussed endlessly on uh website on weibo on uh, chats uh, chat sites on you know places where people talk about how tv and bearing in mind we're talking here about presumably you know, hundreds of millions of viewers um regard these questions of where younger professional women going into their 30s are today and whether society expects too much of them whether you know the the scene that enables them to find relationships is actually effective or meaningful and behind that a much bigger question which i think wasn't addressed maybe specifically in the series, but um, sits behind all of these discussions, which is China's demographic crisis. The fact that the world of the 2020s is the legacy, the inheritance of 40 plus years of the famous one child policy. It was never literally one child for everyone, but broadly speaking, that's that, that, that was true for a lot of people, particularly in the cities. And the effect of that has been that, at least depending on which stats you look at, um, during the height of boy preference for births, that you had something like 118 boys being born for every 100 um, girls. And that, of course, then 10, 20 years on means that actually it becomes very difficult in some ways for the uh, excess men, if you want to look at it in a very brutal demographic way, to get relationships. But in, as in so many societies, the pressure is then on the women to basically settle and partner with the, the men and produce families. Um, and this is pretty much summed up, actually, it sums up the dilemma of one of the um, characters in the uh, in the uh, Nothing But 30 series I've mentioned, which um, was a campaign that was run about 2017, 2018 in one of the provinces of China. It wasn't a, wasn't a national level campaign uh, in which it basically said, um, women, don't sit around waiting for Mr. Perfect. Mr. OK will do just fine. 
Um, oddly enough, this was not the most successful propaganda uh, <laughs> slogan that the Chinese Communist Party has ever come up with. But it expresses in some ways how this sort of top down sloganeering of propaganda tries to address, but actually miserably fails to deal with the much more complex sociology of why family structures, dating and relationships have changed so much in China over the last few decades and continue to change even now in the 2020s. I want to talk a lot more about the one-child policy and the demographic crisis, but um, before sure. I do, uh, so we still have this overrepresentation of, uh, of of men in the cohorts that were affected by one-child policy. I'm familiar with research in, in um, the West showing that on university campuses, when you have an excess of women, you tend to have a more sort of masculine sexual culture because the, the the men are a scarcer resource and so they can set the terms so you have more hookup culture and so on whereas on campuses where you have more men than women you have the opposite you have more monogamous culture the women can be pickier and so on but it doesn't sound as if that's necessarily happening in China that the excess of men is actually giving women more bargaining power in the marriage market or am I wrong about that? It is and it isn't, I'd say. Um, I mean, first of all, I have to say that my knowledge of this is entirely sociological. I don't have much um, you know, personal uh, uh, experience of looking on a kind of granular on the ground basis on this. But obviously one has friends. Um, you know, a lot of the research which has been done on this subject is, is, is fascinating. So I'll try and address it as, as, as best as I understand it from what the research suggests. I think there are several similarities as well as differences. I mean, the similarity actually relates to what you've just mentioned, which is that at least in some circumstances, the question of women being able to be quite picky um, is definitely a phenomenon. To some extent, that's actually, not to keep going on about it, but that's part of the uh, what, what made the plot of nothing but 30 familiar to those millions of viewers. In other words, that you have um, you know, the idea of a woman who's settled when she could have done better, or whether it's a woman who can't, you know, pick any partner because actually, for whatever reason, it's not going to fit in with the fact that she's doing really well at her job and is rising up the ranks and, you know, wants to live a lifestyle in which she has a really nice apartment, designer clothes and things which it's perfectly reasonable after years of, you know, communist austerity that people will want to have in a, uh, a more consumerist um, lifestyle. So those sorts of things do provide a ring of familiarity. And they're certainly talked about in very great detail on Chinese websites um, and in you know the kind of wider discussion in the culture about why the relationship between men and women has changed so significantly. But that said, I think there are some very, very different elements too. So you mentioned you used the word hookup there, and you know, that might be one way of describing um, let's say, you know, the university, late teens, early twenties culture, and an awful lot of Western countries, probably for, you know, half a century or or more by this um, this stage. I always feel quite slightly chilled when people uh, uh talk about, you know, some excess men or excess women, these sorts of things, because it commoditizes them in a sense. And it's always worth remembering that behind these are all these slightly nervous real human beings who are trying to work out what on earth to do with their with their lives. Um, and some of the aspects of how they navigate that space, again, look very familiar. Um, you know, China has dating apps, which are very, very successful. Uh, Tantan is one, Momo is another. There are also specific apps for, for the LGBT community as well. So, you know, there are different um, aspects of the ways in which social media and the development of really extraordinarily high levels of um, technology in artificial intelligence and big data gathering have actually provided opportunities in that area in China. Obviously, uh, Chinese privacy laws being what they are, all of that data is no doubt being hoovered up by you know, the government and will be stored for later uses in some political terms. But in terms of the day-to-day -day operation of something like a dating app in China, it would look, I think, very familiar in terms of those who know Tinder or the equivalents in, in, in the West. Some of those are actually available in China with a VPN as well, but um, by definition, the Chinese language ones are the ones that are used by you know, the majority of the, of, of the population. But the mores, the norms around which people are operating are not the same as those in most Western European or North American um, societies. I'm using that phrasing quite carefully because some what I'm, I'm about to describe actually might sound similar if you have listeners in India, where I think that there would be a kind of combination of the way in which technology creates something very new, and actually an awful lot of the sociology of what goes on is in some ways, you know, dating back decades or even, even centuries to pre-existing social norms. 
So China doesn't have arranged marriages in the way that it would have done, you know, 120 years ago in the era of women having bound feet and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit, I hope, more about um, some of the historical background of how China's changed, much more than India, I would say, actually, as a, a big comparative Asian country in the last century in terms of the relationship uh, culture between not only men and women, but also same sex relationships. But having said all of that, there's still an awful lot that continues to endure in terms of norms in Chinese society, including the necessity to make sure that um, families uh, reproduce themselves and carry on. And that's become even more difficult in the era of the one child policy. So you'll still see plenty of, um, you know, sort of swap markets, you might say, in terms of here's a suitable man, you know, can we find suitable women or vice versa? Um, they're often organized by parents in a way that would be less common in Western societies, uh, not unknown, but uh, uh, but less common, perhaps, um, but actually still quite quite commonplace. In some places, um, Shanghai comes to mind, even a few years ago, you would actually see physical locations, parks, where people would almost go and sort of marry swap markets, you know, a kind of early physical example of a dating app, maybe. That's probably more now, I think, done online, but not exclusively. Um, but it's certainly something in which the parents can and do have a significant role. Um, and that interacts with what you might call a more a, a dating culture that you would recognize perhaps from Western side of the idea of sort of one on one meetings. But again, these are often going to be perhaps a bit tamer than uh, what is expected by some of the people who go on a dating app in the Western um, context. Uh, in other words, sort of if it's, you know, uh, a uh, heterosexual relationship and young man, young woman brought together possibly through an app with parents aware. Um, and that's where, again, the question of if you're a young professional woman with really good qualifications, on the one hand, it may mean that you can become much more picky because there are more men uh, available than there are women. It can also mean, and we've seen this in specific examples, that if you want to get the kind of man who, at least in some contexts, is regarded as being a desirable catch, you have to downgrade yourself. You know, things like, OK, you can mention you've got a BA degree, but for God's sake, don't mention the masters because then you'll seem too smart and you'll scare them off. And the fact that even technically in that case, it will be the woman, not the man who's the rarer commodity. Sometimes that kind of adaptation is uh, is being uh, is being made. That's not to say that, you know, a hookup culture, um, a culture in which people can use apps to basically meet each other for more short term relationships or something more immediately sexual is absent um, from that wider scene. But the context means that that's probably not in many cases the first and most immediate priority if people are looking to set up that long term relationship. And the long term relationship becomes very important. It's true in many societies, but I think it's worth noting in China, in a society which doesn't have very extensive social security, where pension schemes are often uh, quite uh, rickety, and where actually a lot is on the shoulders of that one child from the one child policies. In that sort of case, a relationship doesn't just mean a relationship. It's actually also building a whole variety of expectations about continuity and about creating almost a sort of buffer or a safety zone in the context of an often very turbulent and unpredictable society. Uh, buying a property would be a good example of how that comes in. It's worth noting that I think the property ownership rate in China across the board now is over 90 percent kind of figure which would make young Britons weep, I think, in terms of being able to achieve that sort of number. But again, it comes back to the realization that property is one of those relatively pretty solid investments that, you know, is pretty much there for you regardless of what else happens as long as you keep up the payments. And it's one of the reasons why actually there's been so much anger in Chinese society in recent months and years when it looked as if people who are prepaying for apartments might not actually get those apartments at a time when the building um, uh, industry in, in China was undergoing a lot of bankruptcies and, uh, and collapses. But it all links to that wider question of when you go on that dating app or when you go into that marriage market or when you basically you know, find someone you're interested in, what does it actually mean in terms of both sides for the wider context and not just the one-on-one -on -one relationship? Maiden Mother Matriarch is brought to you by Keeper, the world's most advanced matchmaking solution. Now, many of you will know that I'm normally extremely suspicious of dating apps like Tinder and Bumble, which tend to produce repeat customers who must endure endless, miserable hookups and short-term relationships without ever finding a spouse. Well, Keeper is a completely different kind of service. 
Its algorithm prioritizes immediate attraction, but also, crucially, long-term compatibility, because forever is the goal. Everyone in the Keeper matchmaking pool is there because they want to find a spouse. Using psychometric tests like Big Five, IQ and masculine feminine polarity, Keeper can accurately predict who you're going to have the strongest chemistry with. The platform only gives you a match if you are an exact fit psychometrically and if the match offers everything that you've told Keeper you're looking for in a partner. It won't waste your time with only good enough matches like other dating apps and matchmaking services will. So find your Keeper at Keeper.ai. That's K-E-E-P-E-R dot A-I. So it's very much in the interests of parents, given that they can't rely on the welfare stage or on pension schemes, it's more in their interest to make sure that their children marry well in financial terms. And yes, I think that's that's fair to say. Um, as there's often this phrase that's used 421, which is basically the one child, the one child policy has to look after two parents and possibly four grandparents. It's also actually, to be fair, 421 is a sign of one level of success in Chinese society, which is that life expectancy has gone up um, massively overall in the last 70 or 80 years, not admittedly during horrific periods like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution when people you know, were beaten or, or starved to death. But over time, there's no denying that I think it's now stands at over, you know, average um, life expectancy of over 70, which for an upper middle income country is very good. And of course, that means if you have the happy circumstance of living grandparents for quite some time, you then have the practical circumstance of where are they going to live. Mm. And am I right that there is a, a, a particular problem with grandparents or, or elderly people who are um living in rural areas and their children have migrated to cities and they maybe only have one child who is now at an enormous distance from them. And just the practical issue of care becomes really acute because there's just no one else that they can rely on. Yes. When people, both in the outside world and I'd say in China, look and ask honestly, what are the things that might undermine Chinese society for good or ill and perhaps well, I think, sadly, it's not the question usually of individual civil liberties and human rights. Um, you know, the, we, we, these are things that attract huge headlines in the West, and for good reason, they should do. But if you look at what actually gives um, not just individual Chinese, but I'd say, let's say, you know, sociologists within China who are kind of looking at where the big issues are, um, kind of the heebie-jeebies at night, uh, feeling that actually this is a really tough problem to solve, I would say that disparities between rural and urban China, and in particular, the ongoing crisis of children and families in rural China is central to that. Because a very, very strange, not entirely unique, but nonetheless very distinctive and potentially very negative phenomenon has emerged in the last 25, 30 years, which is essentially that um, in large parts of China's countryside, uh, I know, Jiangxi province, to give an example of a relatively impoverished uh, South Central Chinese province. You have generation after generation of um, parents who, you know, grow up, um, they, uh, let's say they're in their twenties, they're young and strong, and they go far away to the cities to essentially build the skyscrapers and the high speed railways and the airports and all those amazing infrastructural um, uh, pieces of equipment that we've seen were built essentially in the 2000s and 2010s as China's answer to the global financial crisis, basically pumped huge amounts of money into the economy and, you know, build, build, build. Um, I mean, Beijing now has two massive international airports, so I wouldn't put it past them to build a third, but, you know, it's basically almost like Franklin D. Roosevelt back in the New Deal in the 30s in America. You just basically create things for people to do and get the economy going. So that's fine as far as it goes. But when those workers go far away, apart from the fact of their physical distance, they don't carry all their welfare rights with them. Essentially, China has an internal passport system called the Hukou system, internal residence permit. It's not illegal to go somewhere without your permit, but it does mean that you're not allowed to live in somewhere where you don't have a permit for. And the reason for this is they don't want everyone flooding to the kind of golden streets of Shanghai or Beijing and creating these huge sorts of, you know, impoverished slum areas as you get in Mumbai or Jakarta or Lagos. 
So that is that is fair to say um, that, that it has been achieved and that you don't tend to get these huge sort of very impoverished areas in uh, Chinese cities, or you do tend to get sort of grey zones, to put it, put it mildly. But what it means is you can't take your kids with you. So they have to stay behind in the countryside. And who looks after them? Well, it's boiled down in many cases to two answers, both of them not very satisfactory, one of which is grandparents who get older, as grandparents do, and don't necessarily have the kind of child rearing capacity in their whatever 50s or 60s that they might have done in their in their 20s. Or state boarding schools. And, you know, I'm not talking about Eton or Harrow here. I mean, these are generally pretty underfunded institutions, not least because they get paid for by local governments. And again, listeners who are based in the UK will know that um, local government financing or lack of it continues to be a huge issue in terms of the social fabric of this country. If you think about things like paying for social care. Um, well, in China, in rural China, you've got that, you know, times X because um, local governments simply don't have money. They have taken on huge debts, which they now have to repay uh, internally, but, but nonetheless. And paying for the education of uh, children whose parents have gone away in the state boarding schools is, well, I was about to say it's not a priority. That's not true. It is a priority. The problem is it's a priority for which there's no money. So, you know, they're having to charge fees to these immensely impoverished kids. Quite often they're leaving school at the age of 12. The pandemic was very, very weird because the disease itself, COVID, didn't spread in the countryside in the way that it did in the cities in China. But actually the effects of it were that they had to go to, you know, tele-learning and, and so forth. Now, learning from a laptop was pretty difficult, you know, in any country, even if you had a nice house and, you know, a kind of warm uh, environment to do it in. Uh, to do it in rural China with lots of children crowding around, you know, one or two screens turned out to be very, very ineffective. So all in all, China's rural society is massively undereducating the next generation of children who are also suffering, I'll use that word, I think it is true, suffering from the fact that in many cases, direct parental contact is sporadic and, and, and limited. And that is something to which there is not yet any very clear answer. Um, more money is being put into the countryside. And if you look at the five-year plan that was basically launched last year, uh, talking about the new rural plan was was part of that, that mixture. But the problem is there are some, some practical issues that make it very, very difficult. One is that as long as you have that sort of internal passport system, people just don't really go between the two areas legally. And frankly, the, the jobs and the, the opportunities are in the, in the cities. And secondly, the kind of people who could make this better, like young urban graduates in maths or science, uh, you know, it might sound very romantic to say you should go down to the countryside and teach the impoverished children there. But very few people want to do it because you live in pretty, you know, straightened circumstances. The pay is bad. And you worry that if you surrender your, your Shanghai or, you know, Beijing residence permit and go and live in the countryside, how do you know the government's ever going to let you back to the big city? So all of these things mean that there is a real crisis in the countryside. And in some senses, that's a situation a zillion miles away from what we were talking about earlier with dating apps and urban marriage markets and these kind of very well qualified young women in their 30s, you know, taking corporate careers and working out where, if at all, um, relationships and marriage fit into their lives. It's, it's almost like two worlds. So these rural parents who are having to leave their children behind in, in difficult circumstances, have they generally sort of met each other locally, maybe through more traditional means? but they can't earn enough money locally, nor can, I, I mean, they can't be earning enormous sums in the cities either, because otherwise they'd be able to send money back and, and, and have better care for their children. So are they, are they, are they basically being forced into taking quite mediocre work in the cities because there's just no other option? Well, the work in the city often is, I mean, you know, we would in the West regard it as extremely uh, pitiful in terms of pay. Actually, compared to working in the countryside, um, it's often very well paid. The issue is not so much, I think, in many cases, the level of pay. It's the fact that you don't get your welfare benefits built up because you're not in your home area. Uh, in fact, most of those parents do send back remittances to the countryside. That's where a lot of the income comes from. And, you know, it will be sent electronically through um, one of the many now very efficient electronic payment systems that's come through the growth of Alibaba and other uh Chinese companies that can you know, do this in a, in, a, in a flash and you know every, they may not have running water in their villages but every one of these villages will have a phone and not least because the phone is the the you know the, the ground central uh, the ground central in terms of being able to run your life so in terms of where they would have met um 
I think it's fair to say that in the countryside, most relationships would essentially be arranged in a more, uh, you know, not, not, not through electronic apps or anything, but, you know, through personal relationships. There's a very interesting film that came out recently. I wrote an essay about it, which um, readers can find on the Unheard website, about a film called Return to Dust, which was released just, you know, half a year ago in China. It was then quite quickly banned in China, but it's still available in Western streaming services. But the reason it's interesting is that it's a relatively rare look at the countryside in China in a major film, which was at least seen, you know, before being banned there by, I mean, certainly I think thousands of people in in, in China. Um, and it, it, one of the reasons I think it was banned is that it takes a rather bleak view of what future there is or is not for, you know, China's farmers, the peasant community, um, as the, 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 uh, the country urbanizes. But what's interesting is that basically it shows how a marriage gets arranged. In this particular case, it's basically two poor members of the village community who nobody rates very much. And they basically shove together and it's almost like, well, nobody else is going to marry either of you. So you might as well marry each other. Uh, and actually, it's a very touching film. They, they they actually build up a very, very strong bond. And it's it's well worth seeing uh, because the, you know, the, the emotional level of the film is extremely um, authentic, I, uh, I think. But it does give quite a good illustration of what life would be like even now in the countryside, including actually figures who many people would have thought have been consigned to history by the communist revolution, such as the greedy landlord who insists on... Um, charging his tenants huge amounts of money for the land that they're renting and it in one not particularly subtle scene there's even a moment when the uh, male protagonist is having to literally give his own blood to uh the landlord because he's got leukemia i think and you know needs to needs to be regenerated but the the metaphor of uh, of the blood sucking is is clearly meant to be quite pointed in that uh, in that case and it gives a fairly bleak view overall of how china's countryside operates today so Getting back to the one child policy, which is mm. really relevant here, um, it seems that China has learned in a particularly extreme way what many mm. other governments have learned, which is that it's quite easy to suppress birth rates, but it's very hard to get them back. Yes, I think that that's fair to uh, fair to say. I wouldn't say that it was easy to suppress birth rates either, because actually during the 40 years of the one child policy, I mean, first of all, there were an awful lot of exceptions during that time. And actually in the countryside, quite often people would be allowed to have two kids rather than one, uh, particularly in an act of outright clear state of discrimination if the first child was a girl, uh, in large part because the, the girl would then you know, leave the nuclear family and and and, and head out on, uh, on coming of age and, and marriage. Um, but nonetheless, it was an effective policy, particularly in the cities, in terms of restricting the vast majority of uh, certainly urban China to just one uh, one child. And um, as we know, there are an awful lot of unexpected and probably unintended, but nonetheless, very, very um, uh, uh, strongly felt results that emerged from that, including when during the middle period of the one child policy, um, ultrasound came along, it became much easier, essentially, in a country where you know, abortion was uh, available fairly freely um, to get rid of a fetus if it was going to be a girl. Uh, and that was one of the factors that actually led to huge sex imbalance in terms of births and actually led to the banning of um, pre-birth ultrasound in at least some, not in China as a whole, but in some of the provinces of China where the disparity rates were particularly alarming, particularly in, in central China, in, in, in fact. So um, that policy, you know, with all of the complexities and uh, traumas around it, did essentially do what the planners had uh, wanted in the, the 70s, which was to bring the population down extremely um, heavily. The problem is that by the time you get to the mid 2010s, 2015 is when the one child policy in its sort of purest form was officially abandoned. And ever since then, it's been expanding slowly so that you can now, you know, then you could have two kids, then you could have three. And frankly, if you have more than that, I don't think it's all going to stop you these uh, these days. Um, but the problem is that um, it hasn't led to uh, any significant uptick in terms of birth rates. And in fact, rather the reverse, there was huge alarm in China about a year ago, mid-2022, when the statistics were put out about what would happen to China, what will happen to China's population if you basically extrapolate in a straight line from where we are now. And essentially, it would mean that if you know nothing else changed and essentially the um, 
what, what from the early 2030s will be the slow shrinking of the population, not instantly, of course, but over time, then you might end up, and also the aging of the population, in other words, they're getting older as well as uh, um, uh, smaller in terms of overall numbers, then by the end of the century, so by you know, 2100, you could be looking at something like every, you know, hundred, uh, sorry, every 20 um, working age Chinese might be having to uh, support four to five times as many retired age Chinese uh, through you know, the pension system and through you know, having to, to work to, uh, to support them. Now, things as well as the the, the one-child policy showed already, things really go in an absolute straight line. But it is also the case that there are various things that need to be either thought about or done, which will be painful for China in the near future. The most immediate one uh, is that pension ages, which are actually very low in China, they can be depending which sector you're working in, as low as 35 for men and 50 for women. Um, now, Monsieur Macron's recent experiences in France, where basically trying to move the pension age from 62 to 64, um, has led to riots in the streets and cars being set on fire. Um, I think is going to be in some ways an indicator of how big a deal this could be in China. Of course, it's much harder to go and riot in the streets in China because there's so much more control from the party and the police to stop that happening. But the fact that there were protests against the COVID restrictions just half a year ago show that when people get really angry, it's perfectly possible for them to demonstrate uh, in the streets. And I would say that something like basically taking away pension rights, which were one of the few constant things that the party had promised to people, could be very, very painful to do, but it would be necessary uh, unless they can get a huge cash injection from somewhere else in terms of saving the rather rickety pension system in China. And over time, what many societies do in terms of having a an uh, aging and shrinking population is to encourage immigration. But we know that even in Western Europe and North America, countries which are relatively quite liberal on immigration, there are still huge political debates around this question. I think the likelihood of China, which has traditionally been extremely immigration averse society it hasn't really had the um, circumstances in which it would be very likely um, the likelihood that they would shift um, social norms enough to allow significant amounts of uh, immigration in terms of the workforce I think is relatively low you know that said it's not off the table I certainly talked to Chinese policymakers about this because um, a country like Japan which has been even more averse to immigration has had to allow particularly the uh, migration of young but often Southeast Asian women to undertake elder care in a society where actually people really are getting older, but where there is um, essentially a desire to continue to have some sort of human involvement in uh, social care. It turns out, you know, the Japanese tried to use robots first, but it turns out that uh, people don't really like being looked after by, by machines. They, they want human beings. That issue is going to become more and more of a problem in urban China as it becomes richer, but also older in the 2030s, 40s and beyond. And it's not a question to which there is yet any clearly articulated answer that has been publicly made available by the Chinese party or state. Even if it were politically palatable, would China be able to attract sufficient numbers of immigrants? Because obviously Japan being a very wealthy nation Which, still despite its problems yes can 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 attract um migrants from places like southeast asia which also ha also have a low replacement birth rate so as long as they're, they're sort of mm -hmm. overflowing with young people either would china be able to attract those kind of migrants so i think part of the answer to your question um louise is that it's always worth remembering that china is a plural noun in other words there are lots of different chinas within the border so if you just take uh china as a whole it has a per capita GDP of about 10,000 US dollars a year, which puts it, you know, middle to up middle income. But that covers a whole variety of different circumstances from the desperate poverty of Western China to the extraordinary go-go boom economy of Southern China. If you just take the Southern China Bay Area, which doesn't even include Hong Kong necessarily in, the, in this case, you're talking about a per capita income, which is much more like someone in Southern Europe, uh, somewhere in Southern Europe, Spain, Portugal, those, those sorts of uh, uh, places, uh, lots of new universities, well-educated grad graduates, um, jobs in technology, you know, Shenzhen, uh, the city that just borders Hong Kong, is one of the biggest technology hubs in the world. And it also has the huge pool of capital that Hong Kong has basically just to shove across the border and, and invest in those particular areas. So that sort of environment, you can easily see that there would be emerging middle class families living in snazzy apartments who just don't have, you know, are working day and night, husband and wife and probably 
children as well. Um, and basically having um, a you know, domestic helper or someone who comes in uh, at a pay rate, which would still probably better than what they're getting in Southeast Asia, but nonetheless, um, uh, you know, relatively cheap from the point of view of the uh, of the Chinese um, uh, Chinese middle class family. Um, it's a perfectly visible phenomenon, particularly if China gets its wish as a an economy of continuing to grow. You know, post COVID, it wants to grow five percent this year, five percent next year, and so forth. And if it can keep that up year on year in the next decade, then China will be even richer than it is now. Whether it will necessarily be at the level it wants to be, which is bigger than the United States. I think there's a lot of questions around that. That's not guaranteed by any means. But becoming richer than it is now, it's perfectly doable. Of course, there are circumstances which would make that difficult. One would be if there's a you know horrific conflict between uh, the United States and Japan and China over Taiwan, for instance. We can all, I think, we should hope and plan to make sure that that doesn't happen. But I have to say that if that were to happen, it would be the single biggest Axe put through the um, floor of the Chinese economy. It would affect the rest of the world horrifically, and of course, it would be awful for Taiwan. But in terms of China's economic dreams, you know, that would be gone for a generation, it's fair to say. So, in terms of achieving an awful lot of these shifting changes in terms of the economy and society, a period of stability and economic growth for a significant number of years is the bottom, it's the floor in terms of what you need. You need a, lot of, a lot of other things too, including changes in the labor market, changes in technology, changes in terms of being able to, you know, allow sufficient space for people to have families, which is one of the real questions that we have uh, at the moment. There, there's this phrase that you may have heard, it's been a lot on the Chinese internet by younger people saying, we are tsui hoi dai, we're the last generation. In other words, people going up front on social media saying, we don't want to have children because we just think the circumstances in China mean, you know, why would you bother? It's that sort of anger, that sort of anime that the state is trying to push back against. But part of the context of being able to do that, if they can, is that they have to keep the society growing faster and relatively stable and secure and give people the sense that actually there is a sort of forward narrative for China, which they can be part of. Going back to when the one shot policy was first introduced, um, what on earth was the reasoning behind it? <laughs> it it seems from, from this vantage point that it would obviously cause enormous economic problems down the line was it was it based on sort of Malthusian theory or some other school of thought which made it seem like a good idea at the time well there's a fabulous book by the journalist Mei Fong called One Child which is basically a uh, an account from the 70s up to the present day of how the one child policy came into being and uh, why it um, uh, why it's got to where it is now I'd recommend that book to anyone who wants to get the details essentially well, I, I say this merely as a matter of, of, of fact rather than any further commentary, but the policy was entirely thought up by elite scientific men uh, in China. Um, I don't have a sense, certainly from that book and other things I've read, that any very significant number of women were involved in actually developing the policy. And it was based on, in the 1970s, on a premise that was quite wide, widespread throughout wider society, that the biggest problem that the earth was facing was overpopulation. And indeed, you mentioned Malthus, you know, the idea that people might starve to death and people like, I mean, the famous Californian uh, scientist Paul Ehrlich became involved, I think, with something called ZPG or ZPG, if you're American, uh, zero population growth. And oh, quite a lot of fairly distinguished people around the world uh, got involved with this. Now, as so often with things that happen in the world, you know, there are things that happen that weren't predictable at the time. So I would say that the main thing that shifted uh, assumptions uh, during that time was what became known at the time as the Green Revolution. Uh, in other words, the development of new, much more fertile crops that enabled large numbers of people, particularly in emerging markets in Asia, to be fed through the uh, planting and breeding of new types of rice, cereal crops, and other highly nutritious foods. Um, essentially, there are a variety of shifts that weren't spotted, because what happened i mean li literally it was rocket scientists who put the, pro uh, the, uh, the um the policy to uh, together so in this case the answer that uh the one child policy wasn't rocket science was a literal truth but a rather unfortunate one in this uh in this case because essentially what they did was punch a whole bunch of numbers in do an extrapolated line and say this is what will happen if you do this this and this and at, in some literal sense it was fair to say that um you know give or take the overall goal of heavily reducing china's population growth was achieved but the consequences and circumstances surrounding it 
simply weren't understood at that time. And at that time, I think it also wasn't understood because there weren't as many developed societies as there are now on the uh, on the globe, including societies well outside the West, where it's understood that actually, if you want people to have fewer children, you don't need to basically ban them by law, you need to make them richer. And if you are living in Germany or Japan or Taiwan or South Korea, all of which are highly developed industrialized economies, which have never had any laws about how many children you can have or, or not have, all of those societies have either flat or reducing birth rates. I and mean, in the case of Japan, disastrously so, people might say, you know, probably Japanese have more children, not, 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 not fewer, but there's nothing stopping them doing that. It's just that people don't because of the nature of changing society. And that I think clearly wasn't, I mean, to be fair, you can forgive China's rocket scientists in the 70s for not understanding that because I don't think anyone maybe a few very visionary people, but very few people would have looked at China in about 1975, you know, desperately impoverished country still at the end of the Cultural Revolution, and said in half a century, this will be the second biggest economy on the earth with skyscrapers and railway, you know, high speed railways all over the shop. And every single country on earth will be dependent on stuff that happens in China. Uh, I mean, to be fair, I think Deng Xiaoping probably saw it, which is one of the reasons that he, um, you know, pioneered the um, economic reforms along with the man who's never mentioned in China now, Zhao Ziyang, the uh, prime minister who would fell after Tiananmen Square 89 was also very instrumental in the economic reforms of that time. And there's a brilliant new uh, book by a, a young American historian, Julian DeWitz, um, about um, Zhao Ziyang, which uh, you know, tells that story, you know, the bits that really can't be told in China because Zhao Ziyang became persona non grata. But that wider story of China's growth wasn't visible even to the rocket scientists in the 70s. And I think that's one of the reasons that uh, the consequences, the circumstances, the context of what would happen as a result of this policy um, simply weren't understood. It happens even today. You know, you can look an awful lot of phenomena in terms of policy where people put a bunch of numbers in and say, if you do this, this will happen without sufficient reference to uh, People like sociologists who, you know, are very rigorous social scientists, but one of the things that they do with their rigor is to point out that sometimes things are messy and you can't simply extrapolate from a bunch of numbers what's going to happen in a large and complex system like a society. And goodness knows China certainly fits under that description. So planning is really difficult. <laughs> yes. Planning is hard to uh, planning is hard to do. No, yes. exactly. I, I should also point out just in in, in fairness. If you look at the overall scorecard of China, there are lots of things which particularly those of us living in Western countries and also in Japan and India and other places, I think, you know, would have to put down as negatives, including the great and continuing constraints on personal freedom of speech and those those sorts of issues. And as I say, flag those up first and don't be in any way embarrassed about saying that, you know, that is very, very problematic. But at the same time, do look at what, and having been a bit rude about statistics, look at what the statistics show. Liter literacy rates in China have rocketed during the last few decades. It is the second biggest economy in the world. You know, you can have an argument about that, but, you know, it is it is nonetheless an objective GDP based fact that one has to pay attention to. Of course, it's partly due to the size of China, but then, you know, India is almost as large and it's not the third biggest uh, economy in the world, although it's rapidly coming up. Um, in terms of education, you know, China spends 2.4 percent of its GDP between private and public sector on research and development. And, you know, it is obvious that China has has achieved great successes in terms of its science and technology. It's also obvious it's using it for some purposes that the rest of us, you know, might be you know, want to ask some pretty tough questions about. But the idea that in artificial intelligence, in quantum, all these sorts of areas that the China of even 20 years ago was going to sort of bust through the roof wasn't immediately obvious either. So a failure like the consequences of the one child policy, I think failure is not too strong a term to use because of what's happening now to the demographics, should be seen in the context of the fact that it's not as if everything that China's done over the last 50 years has gone horribly wrong. They can point to the emergence of that middle class society that they promised to a lot of people and saying, well, if you live in Shanghai, if you live in Chongqing, if you live in these fourth tier cities that aren't known in the West, you live a lifestyle that your parents and grandparents couldn't possibly have imagined. And that is part of the reality, too, and has to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also, I suppose, in fairness to the um, rocket scientists of the 70s, this was very soon after um, devastating famines as part of the Great Leap Forward. So, so I, I mean, it wasn't just Chinese central planners who agreed with Paul Ehrlich on the population bomb. This was a very, very common view at the time. And I suppose in a country recently affected by that kind of disaster, you would see why people would be more persuaded by it. Um, 
it's maybe a good moment to uh, focus on the fact that China, of course, doesn't have our history in terms of the sexual revolution. There's no sort of 1960s great liberalization and and economic boom and so on from which we from which I have written about at length and you know in which is still so so influential in terms of our contemporary western sexual politics um could you talk a little bit about the what the how how different that history has been in China I think that's right I mean essentially you know your book which takes a, a very skeptical eye on the sexual revolution of the 60s um is a book that in that form would be much harder to write for China because of our you know, parallel experiences being so different during the same period of, of time. The 1960s, for at least you know, some people in the Western world, not all, was, you know, uh, flowers and drugs and sex and rock and roll. In China, it was the Cultural Revolution, uh, at least from 1966 to, to 76. And before that, you know, highly regimented um, socialist uh, um, authoritarianism. But that belies... The fact that the the century, let's say between you know the first decade or two of the twentieth century and and now, so let's say the nineteen twenties to the twenty twenties in China, has been an extraordinarily varied period in terms of Chinese attitudes towards sexuality, towards personal privacy, and towards relationships. And I think um, one of the things that I mean, actually, I'm going to bring in one Chinese historical phrase here, which some people may, may know, but I think it is worth bringing up, which is the May 4th movement. This, for you know, those who don't know, is uh, a, a political movement or a social movement, really, of the early 20th century in China, which is named after the 4th of May, 1919, which was the day that there was a massive demonstration of thousands of students in the center of Beijing, protesting against basically the raw deal that China had been given at the Versailles Treaty at the end of World War One. Again, not always known by all, but 100,000 Chinese workers went to the Western Front during World War One, dug trenches and so forth, while, you know, young French, German and uh, uh, English uh, men, um, Scots, Welsh as well, I should say, British men, um, went over the top and were killed in, in huge numbers. So China made a very significant contribution, not as combat soldiers, but certainly as people in the in the way of danger during that time and wanted a reward. And then in the end, were not given back the, the colonial um, holdings uh, that uh, Germany had held during that time. So that's just the historical background. But the reason this is so significant is that that May 4th demonstration became symbolic of a much wider set of changes in Chinese society during the mid 1910s to certainly mid 1920s, in which influences, particularly from Japan and the Western world, and I know that you have expertise in Japanese anthropology, uh, Louise, so you'll probably be able to correct oh, me on some of these elements. Expertise is but, an enormous exaggeration. <laughs> well, I think uh, specialist knowledge to, to, to put them out a bit. Now, I say that because Japan was a tremendously important conduit in the early 20th century for ideas, either from Japan itself or from the West, as opposed to them always necessarily coming directly to China from the uh, from the West. So all of that very powerful, heady mix was there as China was becoming more open. And young Chinese were simultaneously, in many cases, torn between anger that their country was still being, you know, partly invaded or occupied by foreign powers. You know, some parts of Shanghai were essentially run by the British, Hong Kong, of course, British too, and um, uh, the French had their own concessions too. But also excited and admiring at the new intellectual and sociological opportunities that emerged during that period. And one of them was the development of ideas that for a while were actually literally just transliterated from the English. So the term Normantica, uh, in other words, romantic, uh, was just literally brought in as the idea of this sort of one-on-one -on -one, um, emotional link that would come through a variety of emotional triggers that were uh, were defined in ways that had much more to do with the individual, individuated self. Now, it's not that these ideas were in any way absent in pre-modern China. I would give an example from a thousand years earlier of the poet Li Qingyao, who uh, you know, one of China's great women poets, who clearly had what we would regard as a deeply romantic relationship with her husband at the time and you know, followed him to, to death and, and beyond in, in, in a sense. But the defining of it in those terms is something that very much emerges at that time. Also, an opening up about sexuality. Um, nudism, which um, some people know, became actually, it's always been a particular interest in Germany, actually, and certainly in the 1920s and 30s, the sort of emergence of German nudism as a sort of Weimar phenomenon was also very widely noted in, in parts of China, not, not universally, I should say, but you know, nonetheless, broadly speaking. And there's a young writer who emerged at that time, a young feminist writer called Ding Ling, who's 
one of her two biggest hit stories that was published this one in 1929 it's called the diary of miss sophie now sophie uh you, you don't know that much about china to know that it's not a very typically chinese name uh in this case Shafei, you should um the story is actually meant to be partly a nod to um a pretty daring, uh, if murderous, Russian of the previous uh, century, Sofia Pirovska, um, one of the anarchists who murdered, uh, assassinated the Tsar, uh, Tsar Alexander in the 1880s and was executed for that. Um, so this, the, the, the name that given to this Chinese heroine in the 1920s is meant to be a nod to that, but much more central to the sort of changing idea of relationships is the way in which Miss Sophie, this character obviously, and so is expressing Ned Dingling herself, um, is just open about her sexual feelings that, you know, when she sees this man, she feels the sort of the warmth bubbling up inside her body and she feels lots of iron nails. You know, this sort of thing was a kind of very forward, non-Confucian way of not just thrusting yourself forward, saying what I feel matters, you know, what I think care about matters, but also for a woman to do it was even more transgressive during that particular um, particular period. That's a short story. That's a piece of fiction, although possibly even now one of the most famous short stories in kind of modern Chinese history, uh, available quite easily, by the way, in, in English translation. Um, but also, um, it's spilled over into real life. Um, I wrote a book called A Bitter Revolution, still available to all good bookshops and possibly some bad ones too, which looked at the way in which some of these changes of sexual norms in the early 20th century affected real life. And I found this fantastic set of letters from um, an early, not agony aunt, but agony uncle, uh, who wrote in a Shanghai newspaper, is a guy called Tsiltao Fen. And I suspect he probably may have made some of the letters up, to be honest, but, you know, nonetheless, the wider sociological phenomenon was, was definitely the case, was, you know, I am a young school teacher, you know, I'm a young woman, age 23, working in a Shanghai school, and my boss is, uh, you know, sort of making inappropriate, well, not, he's making comments, asking me to go out to dinner with him, what, what should I do? Now, whether this was literally the case, uh, or not as another matter, but of course, to today's 2020 rice rabbit activists looking at, you know, the uh, the Me Too movement, this story from the 1920s seems very familiar. Young professional women, their feet unbound for the first generation, going into the workplace, into the city, finding their own individual identity as workers, and they have senior men who are basically there saying, oh, actually, your marriage material. And lots of dilemmas of this sort, you know, group of me and my girlfriends went for a picnic in a park and suddenly these young men surrounded us and started making lewd comments you know what should we have done that was a relatively brief window and then to sort of fast forward through the uh through the century the combination of war and don't forget china was invaded repeatedly but ultimately world war ii with japan 1937 and 45 it's a hugely transformative moment it was a time it's not always the case that wars create social conservatism but in this case i think people's feeling of being ripped away from what they knew and what was stable did in some ways push people towards more kind of conservative views even in the communist party which of course rose to power during this period and someone like ding ling i mentioned was actually really criticized strongly by mao for her feminist individualism as, as he put it and then you get the communist revolution takes over the mainland in 1949 and even before the cultural revolution in the 60s it's actually in some ways a very sexually conservative period. There are some things that actually are real feminist advances. The marriage law of 1950, which my brilliant Oxford colleague Jennifer Alterhenger has written about in a book called Legal Lessons, actually does embed rights for women as a result of divorce that were not previously available. And the revolution did do that sort of thing. But it also created, you know, there were campaigns, make yourself pretty for your husband, you know, for, 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 for young women, this sort of thing, which would have seemed very, you know, recognizable from the pre-communist period. And then, you know, the 50s in America, Betty Friedan and all that, you know, turns into the 60s. But in China, it turns into something very different, which is the extraordinary turbulence of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, again, the story is well known, I won't go into, into detail, but essentially Chairman Mao launched a coup against his own Communist Party using China's youth, the Red Guards, a sort of uh, stormtroop uh, grouping in a sense to, to persecute his own political enemies and people who are seen to be an authority, teachers and so forth. This might make it sound very anarchic, certainly in terms of sexuality, but it really wasn't. It was actually a deeply, deeply sexually prurient period for a large number of people, particularly, again, young women could find themselves basically being accused of political crimes because if they'd had an extramarital relationship, it was almost always the women, not the men, who got given a hard time. Or in terms of the way in which the Cultural Revolution portrayed itself. First image, if you think of the Cultural Revolution poster, you know, as these immensely martial looking people in, in, in uniforms. And it's very notable that many of them are women. And they're almost all wearing the kind of same olive drab uniforms as 
for men. So people often, you know, would say, you see, women are being treated the same as men in the Cultural Revolution. You know, they're being desexualized. How often in these posters do you see a picture of a man feeding a baby? The answer, I think, is pretty much zero. In other words, the normative uh, element of the Cultural Revolution was changing what was a kind of natural gendered form into being masculine, with the idea of femininity as such really almost you know, absent from the picture. And that goes you know, all the way through, really, into the 1970s, when Mao dies, the Cultural Revolution is called to an end. And then you have what's often thought of as an era of economic reform from the 1980s onwards under Deng Xiaoping, Zhao Ziyang and others. But actually, it's enormously a period of, of social reform. You know, I mentioned this agony young called Zhao Tafan back in the 20s. The um, Chinese-British writer Xin Ran, whose books, again, quite well known, Good Women of China is, is one of them, um, was basically the equivalent of the Siltao Fen for a while in the city of Nanjing in the 80s. She was a phone-in host on Nanjing Radio. And again, you know, have written this book with wonderful stories um, of young women writing in, you know, essentially post-cultural revolution saying, you know, how should I date? How should I have a relationship? You know, these things had to be learned again in the 70s and 80s because that devastating period before had just broken up most of the norms and expectations and that's why when we think about coming to our own era, you know, let's say the last 30 or 40 years, the 90s through to the 2000s, it's imperative to remember that that back history isn't very long ago. You know, if you're the age of, you know, Xi Jinping and the Politburo, you grew up as a teenager in the Cultural Revolution. And that change in norms in the 80s and 90s, the people who went through that now are in their 50s, let's uh, let's say. And then another generation comes, what's sometimes called the Baling Ho, the 1980s um, kids and onwards with the 40s and 30s. And each generation is inheriting a different set of norms and expectations, but it's as important that they are brought up in the context of the earlier generations who went through that period of communist revolution, as it is to think about the fact that they read what's going on in America or in Western Europe, or in terms of the international influences, both that sort of what you might call the sort of the horizontal uh, um, shift to international influence and the vertical shift, which is basically over time, that experience of China's recent history go to shape attitudes today. I'm going to wrap up the main section of the conversation in just a moment. And what I really want to talk about in the extended bit is um, gender nonconformity and particularly the, the CCP's attitude towards gender nonconformity. Sure. Um, but before I do, you mentioned earlier that uh, part of the cause of the sex imbalance during the, the, the one child policy era was um, the use of abortion with female fetuses. And you mentioned that abortion has 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 been more uh, permissible in China historically than in the West. Can you talk to me more about that? Was was there have there historically been restrictions on abortion, or has there always been a much more permissive attitude taken towards it? Um, I wouldn't say it's more permissive than the West. I mean, it depends which part of the West, of course, we're talking about the United States famously has rather different attitudes to actually most Western European countries, which uh, again tend to differ in terms of Eastern Europe as well. Poland has much stronger restrictions than, say, you know, uh, Czech Republic. Um, over time, abortion has not been a massive taboo in China in the way that it has been at least some Christian cultures and other cultures as well in terms of the, the sociological background. Um, certainly, as is common, I think, actually, with almost all communist societies in the 20th century, uh, China, communist China, made um, abortion fairly freely available where it was possible to do so. The particular restrictions I was talking about, which had to do with sex selectivity and ultrasound, were brought in because of, I think, the alarming sense that the statistics were creating a real imbalance. But that wasn't anything to do with the question of, of whether abortion itself was approved of, but more the, the circumstances which emerged from it. If you go back into the early 20th century, there are varying attitudes in the pre-communist you know, nationalist governments and and so forth, in which certain types of abortion were restricted, but it wasn't again a, a blanket ban in any uh, 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 in any sense. So, I would say that questions around abortion are not have not traditionally been regarded as the sort of big moral questions that have certainly shaped much of the politics of the United States. Although the morality of abortion certainly historically has been one of the topics under historical discussion, I think the question that comes up now is that as China switches to a policy that is much, much more pro-natalist, in other words, really trying to encourage people to have as large a family as possible, whether there will be a shift away from availability. But that's, I think, a sociological discussion that's really in, in quite early stages at the moment and is, is still quite fluid and ongoing.
And I suppose this is a difference that comes down to um, Christianity, because Chris Christianity has always had a particular aversion to abortion and infanticide. And given that's always been a minority religion in China, I you, yes, the, the 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 conflict would be entirely different, not moral, but rather, as you say, you know, it's a switch that you might turn in order to try and control demographics. Um, yes, they're, they're, I mean, again, it, it's one of the things again to do with with norms of society. Uh, I mean, gay relationships in China, for instance, have they were made illegal as in many communist countries, uh, or uh, were even actually medicalized for quite a long period. But in 1997, essentially, gay relationships were decriminalized in China, and, and gay life in China now lives in a sort of environment by which it's certainly not illegal, but it's regarded as uh, not approved by the state in a wider sense, and therefore. Um, a lot of it happens in private, including through apps and various other means as uh, as well. But it's not got the sort of moral freight around it that, at least in some Christian-based societies, was an issue through much of the 19th and 20th centuries. Mm. I want to talk more about this in an extended bit, but <laughs> but for everyone else, uh, Rana, could you let everyone know where they can uh, find your books, find find more of your work? Absolutely. Well, thanks, uh, Louise. And I'd say that if people are interested in China's demographic crisis, do look online on the Spectator website for a piece called China's Baby Bust, which uh, talks about some of the effects of that. And if you're interested in that wider sweep of China's history and some of these ideas, particularly relating to how China has thought differently about relationships, emotions um, and politics over the 20th century, then do please check out my book, A Bitter Revolution, which uh, again is in paperback and easily available, and on World War II in uh, China, China's war with Japan and China's good war, both of which explain why that particular conflict played such an enormous part in shaping the China that we know today. Marvellous. Thank you so much. Thanks very much indeed, Louise. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for watching that episode of Men, Mother, Matriarch and for all of your support. It means an enormous amount for the growth of the show. If you want to hear bonus content, an extra 20, 30 minutes of conversation with the guest, maybe a little bit more personal, a little bit less filtered, then you can go to my Substack at louiseperry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes. And you can also access our chat community. You can also support the show by subscribing on YouTube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on Apple Podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try. Please also spread the word, tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it to give it a shot. Um, the word of mouth effect is really valuable, so we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening, watching, and supporting what we're doing. <laughs>